Revelation chapter 20 is where we're at. The last couple of times that <clears throat> we were together, we went through 19. See the fall of Babylon or the whole of the world systems, the one world religion, the one world government, culminating in Armageddon. Those who would gather in that valley to fight with the Lord, to not just to resist him anymore, but come to actually do war with him. That's amazing to me. It tells you a couple things, though, doesn't it? I think we talked about this, that one, they're going to be aware of, very aware of, who's against them, where the judgments are coming from. We've already seen that again as we've gone through Revelation, different times when it would say they would not repent. This judgment happened... And then they still, they would not repent, but blaspheme the God of heaven. So, and even, even today, we have people who, who will have that heart. You can see that the, the heart of, of societies, of cultures that are so hardened against God that Jesus' name is nothing more than a, 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 a cuss word attached to, to curses. Um. There are probably people out there who use his name in that way, don't even know anything about him. I met with uh, <clears throat> with Pastor Roger yesterday up in Kalamazoo, and, and we were talking about that. And, and being a chaplain with the police department, he's, he's, you know, talking about people that he runs into on the street who don't know anything at all about Jesus. Never went to church. Parents never took him to church. He has never been been church has never been even a mention of their of their life they have no idea and and when he would talk to them they're like you know that sounds kind of good that sounds kind of like it's a whole new idea to even consider going to church or what faith in god could actually bring you the benefit that it would bring that's in a country and in a city where there's literally Tens, if not hundreds, of churches. Obvious old buildings with the steeples and the bells, the whole works to warehouses like ours, where there's a sign outside. Churches everywhere. And and people don't know anything about God. They they don't know anything about his name or what the name of Jesus even has to do with anything. Except for that, they use it attached to their cursing. That's amazing to me. Still, even though I've run into it a number of times, that that his name, the name of Jesus, is attached to curses. It, and it, and it comes out when people are angry, frustrated, hurt. You know, what whatever for whatever reason it comes out. It doesn't come out as a blessing to anybody. What a huge misrepresentation that the enemy has been able to get cemented into our societies. A huge misrepresentation of what the name of Jesus actually means and who he was. One that came to bring peace and salvation and grace and mercy. And instead, it's attached to the curse which is judgment. Well, last week we saw that he comes on a white horse the next time. He comes as a conqueror. He comes as a judge. What they call for in their cursing with his name is coming. And it's coming to them. It's like they're, like they're asking for it, literally. And it, and it is coming. But to those who believe, those who accept him, those who accept his word, that name means to us salvation. It means grace. It means mercy. It means something we don't deserve and we know we don't deserve it. It, it, it means something completely different to one who is fighting against the urges to be like the world. Whether it's 
what we want to do to fulfill our own lusts, our own desires. Whether it's our own frustrations coming out, we, we try to not misrepresent God in those moments because we know we want Him to come as our Savior. When we see Him face to face, when, when, when we experience that resurrection, we know it's going to be completely different for us. Now, if we, if we get to it, I don't know that we'll get to it all the way through 20 today, but if we get to it, we're going to see that resurrection. We're going to talk about the difference between the first resurrection and the second resurrection. Or the fulfillment of the resurrection, however you want to, however you want to look at it. Those there, there are those of us. Hopefully, everyone sitting here today, and hopefully everyone listening, that can't wait for that day. We long for that day. We want to see him. And and yet, there are those who curse that day. Or just reject it altogether as though it's never going to come. We saw with a word, with a word, he will defeat the armies of the world that will gather against him in, in Megiddo, at Armageddon. That the beast, the false, or the, the Antichrist and the false prophet just caught and thrown into the lake of fire. Also when he appears, the, his, his clothes will have the blood of his enemies on them. Before he even comes to the Mount of Olives, where he touches down, where he, where he lands. Before that, he will go through Edom. And, and destroy them. And with him come the armies of heaven. That's us. Right? On a white horse. We're going to ride. Everybody who loves horses, you can't wait. Those of us who don't or have no experience with them, we're not sure what we're getting into. I know I just took a bunch of kids this last summer, a bunch of teenagers to Cedar Point. Whatever thrill they experienced, I say they experienced because I didn't get on those roller coasters, but whatever thrill they experienced would be nothing compared to what we're going to experience. But without fear. Without fear. The two are caught, cast into the lake of fire. And the rest were killed. The rest in that battle, it says at the end of 20, or at the end of 19, the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. So we saw two suppers, right? We saw the marriage supper of the Lamb, the church and, the, and Jesus coming together, and the celebration of that. And then we saw the great uh, supper of the Lord, or the supper of the great God. And that's not good. That is the, the wiping out at Armageddon and the birds of the air coming and, and cleaning it up, for lack of a better way to put it. I mean, we, we have a lot of turkey vultures around here. They do pretty well at cleaning up what's on the side of the road, don't they? Yeah. That's going to be a massive calling of all the, all the a lot of the birds of, of all the earth. All of those who would normally clean up a mess here or there will have a huge mess to clean up. But they will come, and they will, and and all the scavengers will come and 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 be fed there in that valley. And that valley is huge. It's not a little one. It's not anything like we have here. Right? It's wide. It, it's deep. And the, and we saw before the blood will be as deep as the horse's bridle in that valley, and it runs from the north of Israel from just south of Nazareth, Jesus would have seen it growing up, been able to look out from his city where he grew up and see the view. And actually, if you find a picture of it, looking from Nazareth, it's a pretty amazing view. It's hard to believe that you would look into that valley and, and see the carnage that's going to happen. 
And yet, that's not the first war that's even been fought there. Gideon fought the Midianites there. Some, we went through some other, other battles that have been fought in that valley. Evidently, the kings who were to be, or who were at the times, thought it was a great place to have a war. Napoleon even said that. This is an amazing place to fight a battle. It's made for that. But that valley where those battles have been fought, those, those battles are small compared to what's coming. We also saw that there will be no differentiation there in that, in that fight, in that battle, in the judgment that comes at that battle. It will be great and small, king and slave, free and slave, king, king and lesser person. It, he'll make no distinction. Anybody who gathers in that valley to fight against him, no matter who they are, where they come from, what their social economic status is, whatever, however you want to look at it, he won't spare any of them. They'll all be destroyed in that valley. But now we get to another thing that we get to look forward to. Another period of time that's going to be a, an amazing period of time. And that's the, the thousand year reign. When you look at verse 1, it starts right off with the enemy being bound for that thousand years. It says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having uh, the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should not or so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Starts right off. The beginning of it is Satan himself being caught. And you notice it's not the armies of heaven that have to catch him. It's not a whole bunch of angels. This angel's not even named, so it's not even probably Michael. That great archangel. It's just an angel from heaven who has the key to unlock the pit and a chain to bind our enemy. Those two things, that key and that lock and that, that chain, represent the authority of God. Right? He has the authority and the power to overcome Satan. There's another, another verse, I believe it's in, Ezekiel, it's in Ezekiel or Isaiah, that talks about Satan's rise and fall in heaven, basically. But at one day, we're going to look at him and say, this is the one we were afraid of. That'll be the, the response of those who see him probably at this moment. The, that one angel, of all the angels of heaven, only one has to come and, and, and take care of him and, and bind him up and, and throw him in here. He's going to be put into the bottomless pit. This is a, in Luke chapter 8, it's also mentioned there. Let's see if I have it. Uh, when he's confronting the, the man in the tombs, the, the demon-possessed man, and he, uh, Jesus said, who are you? And he says, legion, for we are many. But they cry out to him and say, don't put us in the bottomless pit. This isn't the place for all of the demons to go, for all the fallen angels to go. This is a place, I think, that is alluded to in Jude. For those who left their abode, who, who left where they were supposed to stay and interfered with the workings of men, and they're reserved in chains in darkness for the day of judgment. These are those who were so bad. They're not allowed to roam now. These are not the ones that were probably affecting the bloodline of men in, in the days of Noah. And there's a lot of debate about whether the sons of God and the daughters of men are referring to angels and women or if it's the line of Seth 
I'm sorry, the line of Cain and, and women, if it, the line of Seth, the two mixing there. It doesn't make any sense to me that it's another man, especially not when that term is used of angels else, elsewhere in the Bible. So how does all of that work out? I don't, I don't know. But out of that coming together came the Nephilim, the giants. So it seems there's some kind of supernatural coming together there that wasn't allowed by God. And God has taken those angels, if, if that's what we're getting from Jude, and he's chained them up. They're not allowed to walk and, and roam the earth now. They are already locked up for judgment. But those other demons that were in that man, they're like, we don't want to go there. We don't want to go there with those guys. How bad is it when somebody so wicked and evil, some entity, some demon so wicked and evil as those who were inhabiting this man, who could break chains, who would, you know, cause him to harm himself and harm others. And they don't want to go and be anywhere near those others that were that bad. Don't send us there. And so he sends them into the swine, and the swine run into the lake and drown themselves. <clears throat> but that's the abuso. That, it's the bottomless pit. So if you have a version of the Bible that says the abyss rather than the bottomless pit, it's the same thing. It's, it, it's just a different translation of the word abuso. He's going to be locked up for that thousand years. It's going to be an amazing time. A thousand years. No devil. I think, personally, I think, and, and there are others who, Tim LaHaye uh, would teach this, I think, um, that those who enter into this thousand year period are people who have survived the tribulation, but they have believed in God. So not all of the tribulation saints are going to die. You would also have the 144,000 from the 12 tribes of, the, of Israel. And you have those who have committed their life to the Lord who would not take the mark of the beast, but would still be alive at the end of the tribulation. They'll inhabit the earth and they'll begin to have children. And they'll re-inhabit the earth. Even with those entering in who are eternally secure, right? They, they've given their heart to the Lord. They have served the Lord. Their children will still have to make the choice. And for a thousand years, there won't be anybody on the face of the earth that can say the devil made me do it. Right? You won't be able to shift the blame on anybody. They will have to take responsibility for that. But then why is he let out at the end for a little while? Personally, I believe it's to expose the wickedness of men's hearts. These who are born during that thousand-year time are, are not perfect. You know, the earth will go back to more normal operation, whatever that might be at the time. Whether they're driving cars and flying planes or... Whatever they're doing, societies, cultures will begin to redevelop and build back up. We'll see they're going to be ruled over or governed by us with Jesus, the only world leader on the throne. So think about this. You have a world leader who lasts for seven years, who just brings death and destruction to the earth. You're going to have another one then who's going to fulfill the prophecies of David's progeny being set on the throne of the scepter returning to Jerusalem, uh, of, of his kingdom for a thousand years. And we'll see when we get to the end of this, there's still going to be another rebellion. In verse 4, he says, I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. 
Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. All right, so you have, I believe, the church in the beginning of this, in verse 4, those who, who sat on the thrones, whose judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, so those who were martyred during the, the seven-year tribulation time. So you have two different sets of saints. And, and some will say then, at this time as well, the Old Testament saints are resurrected. Now again, there's a big debate about when they're going to be resurrected and when they're not. I think it'll be here. One verse that I, I, I think speaks to this is, is Job saying, I know my Redeemer lives. And that even though his flesh was going to be destroyed, in his flesh, he would see him with his own eyes. So Job, the oldest story, the oldest book we have in, in our Bible, even then he knew he needed a Redeemer. And he knew that one day he was going to see him. But he also knew that he was going to die before that happened. So Job taught the, the resurrection, the need for a Redeemer and the resurrection to a new life. Now, I, I, I personally think that that and some other verses um, speak to that. Isaiah 26, 19, Daniel 12, 1 through 2, uh, and possibly Hosea 13, verse 14. All speak to the to the the Old Testament saints being resurrected as well. So they gotta have a time when they're resurrected to uh, a life that they expect to live with their with their Savior, with their Redeemer, with their Messiah. So I think it's going to be at the same time. When we see these two groups, they're included in these groups. Probably in the second group. So all of those believers, from the church to the Old Testament saints to the, um, the martyrs of the, of the tribulation time, we're all going to have some kind of governmental responsibility will act as judges for those who are repopulating the earth. Some will sit in Jerusalem with Jesus and judge from there. Others, I believe, will go out through the earth and, and, and begin to uh, help rule and reign in that way. We'll have responsibilities. It's amazing to me when people ask me, what do you think we're going to do in heaven? What do you think we're going to do in heaven? Well, let's just get through the first thousand years here before we even get to heaven. Look at what we get to do. Right? We're going to have a horse. We're, we're, going to, we're going to rule and reign, whatever that means, whatever governmental responsibility or type of responsibility, judgment type of responsibility we have. We're going to have responsibilities. We're going to be at work even though we are already in our eternal glorified bodies. Even though our bodies are changed. And I think, when I say glorified, I think we're going to be like Jesus was when he was resurrected. He didn't walk around shining bright and all that, but he was able to do things that other people weren't able to do. Like, you know, just walk into a locked room where his, where his, his men were hiding and, and in fear. And then we're even more afraid when he showed up. So whatever our bodies are able to do, it'll be different than what we have now. It'll be a different body. Verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So the first resurrection we see is coming in stages. Jesus being the first fruits of that and his resurrection and even at that time, if you, you want to really get frustrated with one of the gospel writers, Matthew tells us that others came out of their grave and went into the city and showed themselves. So I don't know. I assume they left. They didn't just stick around and have to die again. Lazarus did. 
But it would seem after Jesus' resurrection, those who came out in the same event probably didn't have to. But we don't know. Matthew doesn't expound on it. He doesn't tell us what happened to him. We don't, we don't know for sure. And then we'll have the church that will be resurrected. We'll have at the rapture the resurrection. When those who have passed, those who belong to Jesus, they'll get up at his call. And then those of us who are alive and remain, and remain will be caught up together with him to meet him in the air. This is just the beginning of the motions of his second coming. This is the beginning of that rapture, of that, of that resurrection. The first resurrection, I think, is finalized here, possibly. That those who enter into that thousand years, and we'll look at some verses here in a minute that will tell you why I think this, but those who live enter into that thousand year reign with Christ who survived the tribulation and those who are born during that time if they give their heart to the Lord they live through the whole thing if they reject him and we'll look at Isaiah 65 in just a second if they reject him they're going to die in fact, let's look at Isaiah 65 real quick. Starting with... Starting with verse 20. Now Isaiah 65 also describes the new heaven, the new Jerusalem. That describe it in the same detail that Revelation does, but it talks about that. But verse 20 talks about this thousand year reign. It says, no more shall an infant from, from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years. But the sinner, being 100 years, shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not uh, build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands they shall not labor in vain nor bring forth children for trouble they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the lord and their offspring with them so those who have committed their heart to the lord those who have who accepted him and rejected the antichrist those who entered in will begin to repopulate the earth if you die at a hundred years old It'll be like dying as a child. I mean, we look at some trees. I got some massive uh, maple trees in my front yard. Huge. They, they've got to be over 100 years old. And, and we know that I think the oldest, the last time I checked, the oldest living organism on the face of the earth was a, is a tree, if it's still alive, is a tree that they estimated to be 4,000 years old. And we know there are trees that are hundreds of years old, even still. And so to, to, to have your life be the life of a tree, listen, I, think about this when Noah built the ark. It took him 120 years to build an ark. To build that ship. By the time he was finishing the ship. He was already probably on at least the second generation of trees. To use as lumber. At 120 years. 
at least a second, maybe a third generation, depending on how big of the trees he, how big the trees were that he was cutting down. We're gonna have long. Well, <laughs> we will already be transformed, but those who enter into that time period will live a long time. And again, according to Isaiah, if you die at 100 years old, it'll be like dying as a child. But see there in that verse 20 of Isaiah, it says, but the sinner being 100 years shall be accursed. And some scholars think that that is the limit. That is the extent of God's mercy on a sinner during the thousand years. You make it to 100 years old and you're still rejecting Jesus who is on the earth. And no, no devil to influence. Only you. Only your heart that still needs to be converted. Only you who still battles the wickedness inside of you. The, the, the uh, sin nature that we all have. That we all have to fight against. If you choose yourself over Jesus... Then at a hundred years old, you're you're done. So death will still be around. Then death is not destroyed yet. Sinning for those is still possible. During this time. We'll see the animals tamed in Isaiah 11, uh, 1 uh, through 9. Talks about the, the lion, or I'm sorry, the wolf and the lamb living together. Talks about the, the lion and the ox both eating grass. to let go of Isaiah. I'm resisting the urge to just talk about it. We'll go ahead and read it. So Isaiah 11. Verses 1 through 9. says, There shall come forth from uh, a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge uh, by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity uh, for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with a with the rod of his mouth, and with his, uh, with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. Righteous, righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie with the young goat, the calf with the young lion, uh, and the fatling, and the fatling together, and the little children shall lead them. I'm sorry, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow uh, and bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. Nursing, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. And the waters uh, cover the sea. So you're going to have, the again, the first five verses talk about his establishment of his government, reigning in righteousness, and not just by what he sees, but by how he knows each of us and he knows our hearts. And that his word, the rod that comes from his mouth, will, will bring the judgment and will, will set the rules and the governments in place. And by his breath or by his mouth or his word again, he'll slay the wicked. 
but peace will come to, to everything. That'll be the, the, the offer. Instead of the judgment, you can have peace. You can, it's still the same today. Right? You can enter in to your eternal life going for judgment if you want to. But you can enter into this time in peace as well. But it'll be the fulfillment of it. It'll be the acting out of it. And even the animals will be at peace with one another and with men. Remember in Revelation chapter 6, the rider of the pale horse who brings death with him. One of the things that comes to bring, to bring death is the animals losing their fear of men and attacking men. Attacking mankind. And yet here you see little kids will be able to go out and play with snakes. Poisonous snakes. Or what we, I'm sorry, venomous snakes. You, you wouldn't touch those things now. Most of us wouldn't touch a non-venomous snake. I remember a time when my brothers and I went down to a, a field at the end of our road, and we, we caught a whole bucket full of garter snakes. I, they all came out at the same time, caught a whole bucket full, and we brought them home. Mom was happy about that. I had one in each hand, and they were just out a little bit, so they kind of had their head up a little bit, and my brothers rang the doorbell. And Mom opened the door, and I said, look, and Mom slammed the door. But at this time, Mom will be able to go out, go out and play with your pet cobra. Can you imagine? Go ahead. Go play with the cobra. Or go lead your cow and your bear around. You know, just go out and play with them. Drag them around town. Take them for a walk. You would think, by the way, some people, I mean, you've seen the videos of like Yellowstone and, and all that where they go out and they get their pictures taken with grizzly bears and bison and all that, and, and then you see them get tore up by them. You would think they already think we're at peace with the animals. They don't love us. They're afraid of us. That happened after the flood. God put the fear of man in the animals. And so some suggest that the earth itself will begin to go back to pre-flood conditions. Where the earth will give up its, its fruit, its nourishment to us. We'll still work it, or those who, who need it will still work the ground. Still plow, still plant, still harvest. But it seems like it'll be different in that time. Matthew 25 talks about the separation of the sheep and goats. And some scholars believe that that is the beginning of the thousand years where you take and you separate out those who believe and those who don't, or at least during this thousand year period of time, that that's what's going on. The separation of those who are going to judgment, those who are entering into eternal life. Verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. There are a couple places that talk about us being kings and priests. That was something not allowed by the law. In Israel, in Israel, you couldn't be a king and a priest. You could be a king and a prophet. You could be a priest and a prophet. David was a king and a prophet. I believe Isaiah was a priest, I think, priest and a prophet. But you could not be a king and a priest together. So how do we consider Jesus to be our high priest? Well, uh, the writer of Hebrews reminds us that he is a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And if you go back into Genesis and you see Abraham's interaction with Melchizedek, he was a priest and a king. And it's according to that order of priesthood that Jesus is our high priest. He is our king. 
He is our high priest. And Peter would tell us that we, those who are chosen, those who are received by the Lord, who receive him, that we are a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We're, we're part of that priesthood of kings and priests. We're able to be priests, and in this time, it'll be key. Only because of Jesus that we'll be able to be world leaders and priests at the same time. There's not a world leader right now I would want to lead a church service. Not even a church service. Forget about being a priest. There's not one we want to worship. There will be one day, unfortunately, one that they will not only follow as a world leader, but they will follow him as their priest or as as their God. Actually, he'll go beyond that and want to be worshipped as God. He'll enter the temple, we, we saw, and declare himself to be God and defile that, that next temple that's going to be built. We get to be priests of God and of Christ. And we get to reign with him for a thousand years. Now, both of those are responsibilities, right? To reign, to have political type authority, to be able to judge as we've already seen, and to be priests, to be religious leaders. We're going to go from one, well, two, who perverted that image for seven years to the earth covered with the martyrs and the church and the Old Testament saints with those same responsibilities, many of them all saying, go to Jerusalem and worship. Go worship the king. We're not the king. We're not the high priest. So there were many priests who worked in the temple. It wasn't just the high priest. Only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. But you had Levites and priests, two other levels of service within the temple. Who would do the cleaning, who would do the sacrificing, who would, you know, teach and, and, and uh, help to serve the people. And listen, that's where we're at now. Even still, we should be trying. We're not going to be like we are in a thousand year reign, but that is our job as Christians, is one of our jobs to lead the people to Jesus, to serve Him, and to serve those around us, to be servant leaders. That's what He taught His disciples right before He left, right? The one who seeks to be the greatest will be the least. The one who is the least will, will be elevated to the greatest. He acted it out in washing their feet. The, the, the job of the lowest ranking servant of a household. To wash the feet of the guest. And Jesus got down and washed the feet of his disciples. That's why Peter freaked out and said, not me, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you don't have any part with me. So then he flips the other way. Oh, not just my feet, Lord. Wash everything. You see him start ripping his clothes off? Wash it all. And he's like, calm down, Peter. Calm down. You're clean. You're clean. Just let me wash your feet. He's trying to get him to understand. You're, you're going to need your walk sanctified and cleaned up daily. He chose that thing that would happen Daily in a house, you came into your house. I mean, think about it. You're walking through streets where animals are that are dirt and and whatever else in sandals. You know, we just came came back from the camp that we were at. Dirt roads everywhere. Man, days when we wore sandals or flip flops or whatever, our feet were just. We had to wash our feet every day. It, you would have to do that in that culture. Before you came in, mom would meet you at the door. Wash them feet, boy. Don't come in here looking with your feet looking like that. 
Now, hopefully, they have shoes on. We just say, go wash your hands right, before you eat, before you touch anything, before you do anything. Listen, I, I have four brothers. I got three grandsons. We know how to get dirty. I don't, I don't have shoes that make it very far past the door m- most of the time. But you think about that. That's, that's our high priest doing that job. In, in symbolically washing the, the walk, getting them ready to walk according to his word. Water in the Bible is symbolic of the word of God. A man is to wash the feet, or I'm sorry, to wash his wife with the water of the word. It's one of our responsibilities. But listen, we should be washing our children with the water of the word of God. Right? We take this, we take this and we, we open it up. And we t- not, not wash like you're dumping a pot of boiling hot water on them. But you're going to take and you're going you're gonna to refresh, right? You're going to not just clean up. We're not just trying to scrub off all the dirt and all the stains. That's God's job. We're bringing refreshment to them we're not to use the word on our families i mean listen i know people who just hack and whack at people like you know that's the sword of the spirit i'm gonna drive the devil out of my kids with the word of god that's not come on we battle against the world with that we don't go after people we know and love like that A husband's not supposed to terrorize, or a dad, terrorize the family. That just puts distance between God and your family. The whole point is to be hands-on to know your kid. When the Bible says that you're to raise up your children in the way that they should go, so that when they're old, they won't depart from it, that's not talking about teaching them the word of God. There's other scripture that tells us that. In Deuteronomy, it tells us that. To talk about the things of God and the word of God when we get up in the morning, as we go through our day, and when we go to bed at night so that the next generation knows. But when it says to train up your child in the way they should go, it's to know their natural bent and teach them how to use that to glorify God. So you need to know, we need to know our children well enough to know what, not just their personality, but what are their gifts? You know, I, I can remember being so frustrated at about 14, 15 years old. All of a sudden, everybody's asking me and expecting an answer of, what are you going to do with your life? And the older you got, the closer you got to 18, the more intense it became. And at 21, it was even more intense. What are you going to do with your life? How are you going? And you know what nobody ever said to me that I can remember? How are you going to serve God? You think God's calling you into anything? You think God's directing you into anything? Look, where I'm standing now was not on my radar till my late 20s. I am not one of those ones who said, oh yeah, at eight, eight years old, I, I knew I was going to be a preacher. I can look back in my younger years and see the times when I was drawn to the word of God and just would sit and read. And maybe that was God grooming me for this time. I'm sure it was. But that was not my goal in life. I didn't see this coming. In fact, on the day I told my wife, hey, I think I'm supposed to be a pastor. She said, you didn't already know that? I'm like, well, you did? She said, well, yeah. I said, well, why didn't you say something? We're, we're to know. We're to, we're to spend so much time with our family that we know who they are. We know what their natural bents are. We help them. We know what their, what their failings are going to be. We can see that in them. Where they're, the parts of their life that where, where they are missing the mark and we... We discipline, and, and discipline is not just punishment. Discipline is teaching them to get past that. 
That's what the discipline is. But we're to know. We're to be hands on. Peter would tell husbands to live with your wife with understanding. Well, guess what? If you don't spend time with your wife, you don't understand anything. You know? How many times do you hear somebody say, you, know, you never understand women. You're never going to understand women. They're always changing. They're always this. Yeah. But you know what? If you spend a lot of time with them, you start knowing where the changes are heading as they start to come up. You understand what aggravates and what pushes the buttons, and you know to keep your fingers off the buttons. And, and you know, right? You begin to understand what their personality is like, what, what, what lets them know, what can you do to let them know that you value them. Because Peter also tells us they're supposed to be precious to us. Big, burly, loud mouth, fishermen, pull the nets in by hand, man, use the word precious. They're supposed to be precious to us. Listen. Listening now, looking ahead to the future, ladies, young ladies, if you don't, if the men in your life before you get married don't value you, don't see you as precious, move on. Move on. Because God says you're supposed to be precious. They're supposed to value you. Let's get back to Revelation. I've, I've gone on my family rant. Although I believe that's needed more and more because this world, this world and its systems are attacking the family. Listen, pastors have been saying that for decades now, and it's only gotten worse and worse. To the point where you have organizations that put right on their website, our goal is to destroy the nuclear, and by that they mean traditional family. That's their, that's their whole goal. Verse 7 says, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. So in a thousand years, Listen, if you're living hundreds of years, how many kids can you have? You know what I'm saying? A lot. Yeah, go back and read the, the first lineage in, in Genesis. I don't think anybody that says, well, he had 10 kids and that was, you know. It says he had children. The implication is he had many. So many that the, the people, the people who will gather in rebellion are as the sand of the sea. In Gog and Magog, that may or may not be Russia. I don't know. It'll be from that area most likely. Is, is, this isn't Ezekiel 38 and 39. That's going to happen, in my opinion, that's going to happen pre-tribulation time. That attack from the north. And you can see it being set up. And Gog and Magog are, are from the area that we now call Russia. And they are in Syria, entrenched in Syria, to where Syria is not really a sovereign nation anymore. And Turkey and Iran, who are also going to play a major role in that attack, are there as well. The enemies of Israel are forming right where God said they're going to be. And all the other countries that are in involved in that list there are a part of that list russia has their hands in every one of those nations and in their governments so this isn't the the ezekiel 38 and 39 war but this is still that power that seeks to destroy israel jesus on the earth for a thousand years 
And this is still going to be in the heart of men to rebel. Satan's just let loose to expose it. He, he, he's just let loose to, to, to get it and put it in motion. To encourage them to act on what their desires are. What, what was his great desire? To be like God and then to be God himself. To overthrow God. That was his desire. And that has been men's desire. We see it played out in the, in the Tower of Babel. They're already like God, right? We're created in the image and likeness of God. But that rebellion to be in his face, to build that tower, to say we'll do what we will want to do, rather than go out and disperse throughout the earth and populate the earth like God had told them to, Instead, they gather together in one place in rebellion against God. That's why he struck them with the different languages, so they couldn't communicate, so that groups would find each other and move and begin to go out throughout the earth. But these will gather together from, from the four corners of the earth, right? They're from every direction. So they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So they're going to surround Jerusalem. Again, man, Jerusalem is always the target of evil. Always. Even in that time. But look what happens. And fire came down from God out of the out of heaven and devoured them. I was reading this this morning and it reminded me of Aaron's sons who went in and it says brought strange fire into the temple. In other words, they, instead of following the, the uh, commands and the, the rules set by God for bringing in the fire to making the sacrifice and whatever else, they went before God however they wanted to go before God rather than following the teachings of what in the law that was given to Moses and passed down to Aaron. And when they came out of the temple and they were before the people and they had misrepresented God to the people, fire came out of the temple or out of the tabernacle and devoured them in front of everyone. Well, we have seen the throne room of God all through Revelation. To know that the tabernacle, the, the layout, the design of that was to represent the throne room of God. And when somebody comes and misrepresents God, and in here, when they come against him, and listen, to misrepresent God is to be against God. That's why they're called false prophets and false teachers. When they, when they will willingly misrepresent God in his word and what he expects of the church, in, in, in any way, when they purposely do it, they are false teachers, they are, they are false prophets, and they're going to be judged. I mean, Peter talks about it, Jude talks about it, Jude gets real harsh about it. it Paul talks about it in his books. To not follow the false teachers, those who have put you back into bondage, according to religion. If we do that, anybody who misrepresents God, and so even here you have you have all these, all these mass of people that show up to go against him. I mean, we're not talking about resisting him anymore. Now we're coming against him to overthrow him. And that would misrepresent God to the entire world. And when they come, they'll be devoured with fire from heaven. Fire out of the throne room of God. Verse 10 says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's amazing to me how many people believe in annihilation? And by that I mean you will only be in torment for a little while. 
and then God will have mercy on you and you'll just cease to exist altogether. Listen, it says right here, they'll be in torment day and night forever and ever. And it's, it's not just false religions like the Jehovah's Witness that teach that. There, there are, I just found out this morning, a, a man, a Bible teacher that I held pretty high honor believes this or believed this I think he's passed now and in the the person one of the articles I was reading this man wrote a a book with a another very popular preacher of today and their whole goal was to be against that right to to give the argument against annihilation but in the end, he, he just said, well, we leaned very heavily against eternal torment, but we left the door open for annihilation. What? So you spend a whole book on this is what it means when it says eternal torment, the, you know, the, the, the worm never dies or is Weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, the outer darkness, the and and then here the the lake of fire that's created for Satan and his and his angels, the ones who followed him. And that judgment, it says here, night and day, forever and ever. And this isn't the only place that it talks about it being eternal. Listen, we're all made to be eternal. The human soul is made to be eternal we either enter into the new Jerusalem the new heavens the new earth the new creation with God because we have committed our lives to him and we'll get to that hopefully next week we, you have that to look forward to that's going to be eternal that's going to be forever and ever but if you reject Jesus that's not going to be forever It will. It'll be uh, here. It says very plainly, Gehenna is going to be forever and ever. I'm going to go ahead and, and end here. So we'll pick up verse 11 next week just because I want to spend some time on the books that are open. I don't want to just kind of blow through that. We're going to see the great white throne judgment. That judgment for those who have rejected God from the beginning of time until the end of the thousand year reign. They will then be resurrected, but resurrected to judgment. And there'll be a judgment that happens. And we'll talk about that, how that's going to be carried out next week. But verse 15 kind of repeats what verse 10 says. It says, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And it'll be eternal torment forever and ever. Don't doubt that. Escape that. You escape that by giving your heart to the Lord, by receiving his word, by taking his word. By taking him at his word. Jesus would tell us that all who come to him. Anyone who would come to him. He won't turn away. In the book of Romans we know. All have sinned. All. The Bible says all. It means all. All have sinned. From Adam down. And fallen short of the glory of God. But Paul goes on to tell the Romans. That if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. That's the beginning of your relationship with Jesus. That's, the, that's where we all begin. And some will say well that's just. I've heard it termed easy believism or easy grace. That's not easy. 
it's not easy to commit your life to somebody else. It may sound easy because the words sound easy to say, God, forgive me. But in our hearts, it's not easy. You might even be able to say it with your mouth, God, forgive me, and not believe it. We see the, the great evangelists, the ones who have, who have preached, the ones who have thousands of people come and thousands of people respond to their calls to salvation. But when you, in interviews, Billy Graham, uh, Greg Laurie, some others, they know. They know that only a fraction of those who actually respond really become believers. So going to an altar doesn't make it so. It's not about where you do it. It's not about who all is around and who's not. It is being willing to admit that we're sinners. To admit that we're wrong. To ourselves. We know ourselves better than anybody else except for God. We know if we're trying to fool other people. Confess your sins. And what what does he say? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. doesn't say you come first cleaned up. Go get cleaned up and then come to me. No, you come to me, but you got to come ready for me to clean you up. We're going to go through the process spiritually that Peter and, and the others went through at that last supper, at that last Passover. Wash me. And then daily, Lord, wash my walk. To be like David and say, examine me and see if there's anything unclean, anything wicked in me, and then, Lord, you deal with it. To be humble enough. I mean, that's the, that, that is the greatest king, arguably, that Israel ever had. And we know he failed, and God has shown us his failures in his word. But in the Psalms, David, to be humble enough to say, I know I fail. And just in case there's anything I'm, I'm forgetting, Lord, you examine me. You see the dark spots in my heart. It's an acknowledgement of knowing that God, God sees. You examine me, and whatever's there that shouldn't be, let's get rid of it. To get rid of the pride, because that's the thing that's going to keep you from doing that. You have to kick that aside. You have to embrace the Word of God. You have to... You have to cry out to him again in Romans chapter 10 he says all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved Jesus said I, all who come to me I won't lose I won't I won't push away I won't I won't reject any of them if they'll come to me I won't reject them you know by the way if you come to the Lord you've been given to him by the father and he says, all that the Father's given me, I won't lose a single one. And he promises to be with us forever. Promises that it will give our hearts to him. He'll never, ever walk away from us. I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. He's promised. So what holds us back? What keeps us, except for our own pride, our own desire to do what we want to do, what makes us feel good, what we think makes us important to other people, whatever else it is. What, no, that's what's holding us back. We. Look in the mirror. We're the ones holding us back from what God wants to do in our lives and with our lives. And so daily, I think, if you're a believer, daily, we've got to check our priorities. We've got to check and see what's going on in us and give it to God. If you're not a believer, 
if you want to be not in, tor- in torment forever and ever, but you want to be in the new heavens, the new earth, the new creation with Jesus forever, then you need to give your life to him today. Don't wait. The Bible tells us today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to be saved, not tomorrow. You know, Thank God for that mom who at camp brought her daughter back to to pray with us. You know? She said, well, I'll just do it tonight. And her mom was like, you don't have any service tonight. And I don't know if they were leaving that day or they were going to leave in the morning. And she, w- or she was there the next morning, yeah? Her mom could have said, well, just do it tomorrow morning. But instead, she said, no, let's go. Mom, grandma, get on the golf cart with little girl, with their daughter, granddaughter, and brought her back up there. And, w- and we all, our whole, our whole family got to, got to be there with that little girl and, and pray with her to receive Jesus and celebrate with her. And it, if she had been the only one, and she wasn't, but if she had been the only one, the whole thing was worth it. The whole thing. And it's worth it for her. It was important for mom to bring her back. It's worth it for that little girl to know Jesus. Just crossed my mind. A a life like Timothy. Mom and grandma. I don't know who dad and grandpa even are. Never even met them. But Timothy's mother and grandmother brought him up in the ways of the Lord. Taught him the scriptures. So that when he was presented with that moment, he recognized it and he knew. And we got to see that. So keep praying for the people you know who haven't received. If you haven't received the Lord, today's the day to do it. If you think you have and you're not sure, today's the day to do it. If you've just gone through the motions just to make everybody else ha- happy, stop. Get real with God. Put your life into his hands. You can trust him with it. And you can trust your whole eternity with him. Put your life into his hands and see what he does. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask that you would be with those who maybe are on the fence, those who are not sure what to do or not sure if they will. Lord, let's pray. And we, and we can all think of somebody right now Lord, that, uh, that we know, family members, friends, neighbors, who don't know you. Lord, help us to be the light. Lord, I I pray that all of us would hand our life over to you in such a way that those around us will see you. Lord, give us the wisdom to be able to speak, the boldness, the strength to be able to live for you in a time and in a culture that rejects you. For us to not be afraid. To not be afraid of what men could do. Lord, thank you for calling us. Thank you for using us to do your will. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.